Okay, let's uh let's go ahead and uh and pray and begin our, our discourse in uh in Mark uh chapter 13, uh part one. Lord, thank you again for the life of Christ and that we are able to uh, uh, track his life and some of the things that Christ accomplished in his first advent, all, leading all the way up to the death, burial, and resurrection. I thank you, Lord, for the specificity of, of, of Mark by way of Peter and giving us his notes so that we may be able to, to see uh, Christ's work and the importance of that work. We thank you so much for this time. I pray, God, that this would uh, we would uh, remove distractions and, and be able to focus um, so that we can glean truth um, and, uh, and be encouraged and strengthened by it. Love you so much, Lord, for it's in your son's name. Amen. Now, uh, Mark chapter 13. You know, I did not want to be the eschatology guy. I, you know, um, I... <laughs> I've tried uh, when I was, uh, you know, a, you know, searching out the scriptures and studying this stuff. And, you know, I would talk with some of my friends who I mentioned in the previous lecture uh, last hour that, you know, I always thought to myself, I didn't want to be the guy who everyone looked at with the tinfoil pyramid hat, um, with the bendy straws. You know what I'm saying? I did not want to do that. There are people that do it much better than me. And, you know, we, we, I've gone through 20 chapters of Revelation and now I'm in Mark 13 and we're talking about eschatology. I didn't want to do that, but uh, there you go. That's the the, 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 yeah, yeah, the, 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 the die was cast. So let's uh, let's go ahead and talk uh, about the previous episode before we get there. Uh, in Mark chapter 12, uh, um, Will had laid out uh, some of the things, some of the highlights from that particular chapter. And uh, that Jesus was addressing the scribes, Pharisees, and chief priests. All of this occurs on day three uh, at the temple, right? Um, he rebukes uh, not, the, not everyone, but the, the, the Jewish leadership. That is the point there, okay? And then we see the dialogue between Jesus and the Jewish leaders back and forth, and how essentially Jesus is exposing uh, the leaders of, 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 the, of the Jews for who they are, the character that they have, that they do not have the individual's best interests, right? And they don't teach the truth. Um, because of this, there is a growing divide between Jesus and the Jewish leadership. Remember, he's doing all of this activity within uh, the capital, right? Uh, District one, right? And everyone is recognizing this, right? And this is becoming a demonstration to the Jewish leaders who are essentially trying to silence um, him. They don't want him to speak. So they come and ask him all these questions and try to trip him up. Um, but Jesus handles them very, very well, right? And again, displays who they are. Now, before we get to Matthew chapter 13, we have to set the stage here um, because this, again, all this occurs on this single day, okay? So before we get to it, we, we got to set the backdrop. So please, if you will, keep your thumb on Mark 13. We're going to have to go to the book of Matthew chapter 23. Again, I apologize, Will. You know, you're, you're in Matthew on Wednesdays. Um, but, uh, you know, by the time uh, you get there, they will have already forgotten. That's probably true, too. Chapter 23 of Matthew also occurs on the same day as well. Matthew gives us some details that Mark does not. Okay. Let's uh, just go ahead and go work through this briefly because we got a lot of stuff to cover. So I'm just going to cover this briefly. Okay? Jesus, after conversing with the Pharisees, okay, gave a series of woes, not on the nation itself, but on the Jewish leadership. That's what these woes are about in chapter 23, verses 13 and following. Okay? 
The first woe is the poor teaching concerning the kingdom of God, right? The woe to you scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, right? You actors, right? Because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people you do not enter in yourselves, right? Woe number two concerns the corrupting of the proselytes because of their poor teaching. So not only are they in infecting uh, their own people, but those who were seeking to, to identify with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? Those who are, who, are, who are Gentiles. It says, woe to you, verse 15, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel around on sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. What a, what a statement, right? Woe number three, the error of their instruction, which produced a vain, empty worship, right? That's verses 16 to 22. And again, Will will give us the details later on, right? Kicking them and keep moving here. Woe number four, their neglect of the weightier matters of the law of Moses. This is verse 24. And 23, right? Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Woe to you, you tithe, mint, mint, dill, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. You should have done this, but you forgot these. You should have added these to what you're doing, right? Woe number five, their motivations and intentions were extremely poor. Verse 27 and 28, talking about the whitewash tombs, not a, not a nice thing, right? They appear beautiful, but inside they're full of dead man's bones and uncleanliness. So you too appear outwardly righteous to men, but inwardly you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And woe number six, I love this one. This was kind of cool. This woe six, uh, they make, well, if I was, if I was there, statements. But their actions prove otherwise. Let's, let's read this one, verse 29 and following. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, uh, for you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn monuments and say, well, if we had been living in those days of our fathers, we would have not been partners with them in shedding the blood of prophets. If I was there, man, I'd be a faithful servant, man. Verse 31, so you testify against yourselves that you are the sons of those who murder the prophets. So you guys say, well, if I was there, yeah, you would be murdering them too. That's basically the idea, right? Because of the way that they've treated the Messiah and those who believe in the Messiah, by the way. This is an interesting statement in verse, in verse um, 35 and following. Their condemnation is just because of, uh, because of who Jesus will send to them, right? He says, so the... Um, um, therefore, verse 34, behold, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogue and persecute from city to city, so that upon you the guilt of all the righteous blood may sh shed on the earth from the blood of the righteous from Abel to the blood of Zechariah to the son of Bacchiah, whom you murder between the temple and the altar. Truly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. The book of Acts details this, right? The way that the, the, the Pharisees mistreated the apostles, right? Shows that their condemnation is just. They did not believe the message. As a matter of fact, they, tend, they, they wanted to squash it. One of them became a believer in the Messiah himself, the apostle Paul. Then Jesus goes on to lament and gives a judgment concerning Jerusalem. Again, keep in mind, this is not within the context of all the people of Israel, but the Jewish leaders themselves. Verse 37, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets 
and stones those who were sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is being left to you desolate. I find that fascinating because just the day, just the day before, he talked about his house being a house of prayer. But now, because he's he's been rejected by the scribes, the Pharisees, those who are the leaders of Israel, <clears throat> he calls that house their house. This isn't my house. This is your house. And it will be left to you desolate. Verse 39, for I tell you, you will never see me again until you all say, he who comes in the name of the Lord is the blessed one. What a statement. Jesus came into Jerusalem to do the same thing that he did all around Israel. That is, that is the thing that we've been studying for, the, for all of these 12 chapters. He's been doing all this activity, doing all this teaching. Now he goes into the capital itself and is doing all this teaching, doing all this healing. And the, and, the, and the Pharisees who are locked into the capital refuse to believe this. They will not accept this. They try everything they can to stop it. He wanted to demonstrate who he was among the leadership. I'll just go to the leadership myself and demonstrate it. And since they did not receive him, the inauguration of the kingdom is postponed. It is, it is, it is postponed. And Jerusalem, the house of the temple would be destroyed because it's not his house. It's their house. Okay. Now, because of that, now we could turn to Mark. Mark 13. Because this is his statements and the questions that follow from the apostles, who are his disciples right now at the time, are on the heels of this, these quotes. These statements. Mark chapter 13, verse 1 and 2. As he was going out of the temple complex, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, look, what massive stones, what impressive buildings. Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left upon another that will not be thrown down. This place will be raised to the ground. They will take every, they will take every brick and, and out of here. Jesus, as he was walking on the temple, now keep in mind, Jesus is still in Jerusalem when this statement is made. He came out of the temple. He's still there. They're having this conversation here, right? One of his disciples marvels at all of the buildings and the stones. Wow, look at all this. Wow, this is great, right? This is where God is. This is where this is where the temple is. This is where we were. What, what a fantastic building this is. And Jesus replies that the buildings and stones would be raised to the ground. Not one stone will be left upon another. Again, this is important to note when we get to verse three. And following, there is a scene change. OK. So let's go ahead and look at it. As he was coming, going out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, teacher, behold, what wonderful stones and what beautiful buildings. And Jesus said to him, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left upon another, which will not be torn down. Verse three, as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives. This is fascinating because the Mount of Olives is about a mile and a half from the temple, about a 30 minute walk from the temple to the Mount of Olives. So that tells us they, they thought about his statement. Okay? They didn't just come out right away and ask him these questions. He said this statement, and as they were walking, the disciples were like, what is it? What? That's very curious to me. Why would he say something like that, right? The point is, from the temple to the Mount of Olives, again, the disciples thought about what Jesus said. More than likely, this disturbed them. They were very curious about when this would occur. 
So they, in the text, we have Peter, James, John, and Andrew. This is important because, again, Mark is with Peter, right? This is a firsthand account that Mark is writing um, when, he, when he's traveling with Peter and writing his, writing his notes down. They asked Jesus a question. I meant to put uh, uh, verses three and four here, but we'll go ahead and read it anyway. Verse three, as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew were questioning him privately. Verse four, tell us when these things will be and what, the, and what will be the sign when all these things are going to be fulfilled. Now, one thing I'd like to point out is that Jesus's answer from this point forward centers around the temple and by extension Jerusalem because this is what he told them when he was coming out of the temple not one stone will be left upon another they thought about this all the way up to the mount of olives right and now they're going to they're sitting down and asking him about this now Jesus uh is going uh, uh Jesus already gave them what was going to happen in the short term with the temple in verse 2, okay, that points to 70 AD, the destruction of the temple by Titus Flavius in the year 70 AD when the temple is destroyed and all the gold is sent out. But Jesus also points to, he begins to focus on a future time, that is the time of Jacob's trouble for Israel. Mark details Jesus' teaching and instruction to Peter, James, John, and Andrew concerning the things to come as it relates to the temple and by extension to Israel. Mark chapter 13, verses 3 and following. While he was sitting at the, on the Mount of Olives across from the temple complex, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us when these things will happen and what will be the sign when all these things are about to take place. Then Jesus began telling them, watch out that no one deceives you. Mary will, Mary, many will come in my name saying, I am he, and they will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed, yet these things must take place, but it is not yet the end. Verse 8, for a nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be various earthquakes in, in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pangs. Verse 9 and 10, but you be on your guard. They will hand you over to Sanhedrins and you will be flogged in their synagogues. You will stand before governors and kings because of me as a witness to them. And the good news must first be proclaimed to all nations. Verse 11 and 12, so when they arrest you and hand you over, but don't worry, don't worry beforehand what you will say. On the contrary, whatever is given to you in that hour, say it, for it isn't you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Then, then brother will betray brother to death and father his child. Children will rise up against parents and put them to death. And you will be hated by everyone because of my name, but the one who endures to the end will be saved or delivered. Big chunk of passage here. Let's go ahead and go through this real briefly. Jesus begins his discourse by warning them that they ought not to be led by false doctrine concerning this issue, okay? That there will be many that will, that will come and proclaim that I am he. We have to pause and talk about this. This is Mark chapter 13, verse 6. The phrase here is ego a me, okay? I, I am, right? This is an emphatic statement, okay? This uh, phrase occurs 10 times in the Greek scriptures. Now, I'm going to sword drill you guys. So, you know, either write it down or get your, get your pencils out and ready because I'm going to go through these real fast, okay? In John chapter 8, verses 18, we see the same word used here concerning Christ. 
I am he who testify. I am the one who testifies about myself and the father who sent me testifies about me, right? Ego a me is used at the beginning of this statement. In John chapter eight, verse 24, I told you, therefore I told you that you will die in your sins. For if you not do not believe that I am he or I am, you will die in your sins, right? John chapter 8, verse 24, when Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. Four verses down, verse 28. The, so Jesus said to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing on my own. But just as the Father taught me, I say these things, right? John chapter 13, verse 19. I'm telling you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am he, or I am. Ego me. John chapter 18, verses 5 to 7. Jesus the Nazarene, they said, they answered, I am he, I am he, Jesus, told them. Judas, who betrayed him, was also standing with them. And when he told them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Then asked him again, who is it that you're looking for? That's what Jesus asked. Jesus the Nazarene, they said. And he told them, I am, I am he, and they fell backwards. That's rather unusual, right? That tells you, uh, uh, that informed them about who Jesus was. John chapter 18, verse 8. I told you that I am he, Jesus replied. So if you're looking for me, let these men go. And last one, Revelation chapter 2, verse 23. Concerning uh, Jezebel. It says, I will kill her children with the plague. Then all the churches will know that I am the one who examined minds and hearts, and I will give each of you according to your works. Now notice all of the instances of these of the phrase ego a me come from John. John picks up on this. Okay? He picks up on this very this unique phrase. An interesting observation here, this phrase is also used in the Hebrew scriptures as well. I am he. Okay? This phrase is anihu. That's the phrase here. It occurs seven times in the Hebrew scriptures and in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the, of the Hebrew scriptures, it is translated ego emi. Okay? Again, I'm going to go through these real quick. So, so uh, write them down, or, or uh, if you're fast enough, you got the tabs in your Bible, you can, you can follow along. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 38 to 39, we see this phrase, anihu, in this passage. Who ate the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their drink offerings? Let them rise up and help you. Let it be a shelter for you. See now that I alone am he there is no god but me i bring death and i give life i wound and i heal no one can rescue anyone from my hand in isaiah 41 verses 3 and 4 it this is used he pursues them, going on safety, hardly touching the path with his feet, who has performed and done this, calling the generations from the beginning. I, Yahweh, am the first and, and with the last. I am he. Ego Amy. Isaiah 43, verses 9 and 10. All the nations are gathered together and the peoples are assembled. Who among them can declare this and tell us the former things? Let them present their witnesses to vindicate themselves so that the people may hear it and say it is true. Verse 10, you are my witnesses. 
This is the Lord's declaration. And my servant whom I have chosen so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. No God was formed before me and there will be none after me. Oh boy. Isaiah 43 verses 12 to 13 says this. Now again, I, I believe that John, um, I believe that John used Isaiah as 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 a primer for uh, for the book of John. There's just there's too many references uh, that John makes that are found in Isaiah. I mean, it's just it, it's crazy. Um, even the term that he sent me, that's in Isaiah too. I alone declared, saved, and proclaimed, and not some foreign god among you. So you are my witnesses, right? And 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 this is the Lord's declaration. And I am God. From today on, I am He alone and none can deliver from my hand. I act and who can reverse it? That's Isaiah 43 verses 12 to 13. Isaiah 51, 12. I, I am the one who comforts you. Who are you that you should fear man who dies or a son of man who is given up like grass? So when Jesus is telling them, see to it that no one misleads you, for many will come in my name or my reputation saying, I am. They will declare themselves as God themselves. That's the point. Okay? The Lord. All the references of I am. Ego, a me, anu, who. Refer to the Lord. And God is, and, and, and Jesus is warning the disciples, there will be many that will come saying that I am God. I am him. I am he. And they will mislead you or try to. Jesus, is, Jesus was warning his disciples that many will come proclaiming themselves to be the Messiah, that is God, because only God can only God could claim that title as the Mashiach. Only God could do that. No, no other, no human being uh, 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 can claim that title other than Christ himself. And as a consequence, they will mislead Israel. Again, this is the backdrop. Jesus then turn, walks the disciples through a series of unfortunate events as it relates to Israel and the time of Jacob's trouble which is found in Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 5 and 7. He will lay all of this out in detail. <clears throat> verses 7 to 13 of chapter 13 speak of the first half of this time of Jacob's trouble, or what we would like to refer to as the, uh, the seven-year tribulation, or the period of, of affliction, right? Right? So chap verses 7 to 13 speak of the first half of this particular time. Let's compare what Jesus says to uh, the book of Revelation and the seals that are broken. In, uh, in verse 7 of uh, Mark 13, he talks about wars and rumors of wars. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. In Revelation chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, this is the second seal judgment. <clears throat> Matter of fact, I'm going to turn there. Now, for those of you guys who have not come on 9 o'clock, this is what you get at 9 o'clock. I know it's too early for, for most people. It's too early for me. I don't even I don't start dreaming until about 8.15. Revelation chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. <clears throat> when he broke the second seal, I heard the living creature say, Come, and another, a red horse, went out, and to him who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from the earth, that men would slay one another, and a great sword was given to them. Nations will become hostile to other nations. Kingdoms against kingdom will become hostile, because peace will be stripped from the earth. 
Jesus in verse 8 talks about there will be earthquakes and famines, plagues, right? In various places. This is the fourth seal in Revelation chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. When the Lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the living, four living creatures say, Come, and I looked, and behold, an ashen horse, and they who sat on it was death and Hades. Authority was given to them over the fourth of the earth to kill with sword and famine and death and by the wild beasts of the earth. Jesus talks about they will deliver you to be flogged in the synagogues. They will arrest you, verse 9. This is the fifth seal. It says, and when the lamb broke the fifth seal underneath, I heard the altar of the souls who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony which they had maintained. They are arrested because of the message of the proclamation of the kingdom of God coming and that the one who is the conqueror is a fraud. He is not the one. The, the conqueror will seek to squash this message. And Jesus tells them this in chapter 13. After this, Jesus in chapter, uh, chapter 13 of Mark gives them a word of encouragement. Okay. The gospel must first be preached to all the nations. This is not the gospel of Christ. Remember, the, uh, Mark 13, Matthew 24, the church is not in here. Okay, This is concerning Israel and the temple and Jerusalem. The gospel that, that Jesus is talking about here is the gospel of the kingdom and the Messiah that he is coming. Prepare, get ready. Right. He is coming to set things right, to establish an everlasting righteousness. Okay. This is verse 10. The gospel must first be preached to all nations at this particular time that Jesus is talking about, the time of Jacob's trouble. This is connected to the 144,000 in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 7, verses 4 to 8. They will bear most of the weight of this service to the world. They will be set apart to proclaim this message. There will be others, but mostly it will fall to them. And because of this time and this message, they will be hated by the conqueror. And will be sought to be killed. But the enduring ones, the ones who endure, that is verse 13. You will be hated by all because of my name or my reputation, but the one who endures to the end. Jesus is discussing the people at this particular time. This is not referring to the church. This is not referring to the uh, uh, to uh, the. The, the P in tulip. Okay? This is not referring to that. This is referring to the time of, the, of, the, of Israel during Jacob's trouble. That those who make it all the way through and proclaim this message will be saved physically. They will enter into the kingdom as a human being. They will be rescued from the hand of the conqueror. Okay. That is the first part of this. So the first half of chapter 13, verses 1 to 13, answers the first half of the time of Jacob's trouble and all the events that occur here, and they are just the beginning they are, they are the beginning of birth pains. It's not the worst yet, right? We're not at the end. When you see these things, we're not there yet. Okay? We're close. We ain't there yet. Mark, thir Mark chapter 13, verses 14 and following. We'll read and make some observations here. 
When you see the abomination that causes desolation, standing where it should not or standing in the place, let the reader understand. Then those in Judea must flee to the mountains. A man on the housetop must not go down or go in to get anything out of his house. And a man in the field must not go back to get his clothes. Woe to pregnant women and nursing mothers in those days. Pray it won't happen in winter. For those days will be of tribulation, the kind that hasn't been from the beginning of the world, which God created until now and will never be again. Unless the Lord limited those days, no one would survive. But he limited those, those days because of the elect whom he chose. If anyone tells you, look, here is the, the Mashiach, the Messiah, Look there. Do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will rise up and perform signs and wonders to lead astray if possible the elect. And you must watch. See, I've told you everything in advance. Right? Jesus begins to discuss now the midpoint of this time. So we talked about the first half. Now he's going to talk about the midpoint. Again, very orderly here. He speaks of the abomination of desolation. Again, this goes right back to, they would know this phrase very well, because this goes back to the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verse 27, and the activity of the abomination of desolation. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, it says this, that he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week, the many in this context is Israel. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and offering. And the abomination of desolation or the abomination that causes desolation will be on a wing of the temple until the decreed destruction is poured out on the desolator. The desolator, the abomination of desolation, and the phrase he is the same person. Okay. He will deceive Israel by making a firm covenant with them. But in the middle of that covenant being enacted, he will invade Israel because they're protected. I'm sure there he's offered. Let me offer, let me offer you some protection. Right. Let me offer you some protection. And then he goes in and invades them and puts a stop to sacrifice and offering. I'm sure that Israel will look at this individual as a Messiah figure. He will be influential and they will realize, oh, my gosh, what have we done? Right. And he will destroy them and pillage them. And take them captive. When Israel was to recognize this, all the, the Israel was to recognize this ultimate tyrant when they do those who read and understand this, they are to leave immediately. They're not even to get their cloaks. Don't even get your clothes. Don't pack. Don't, don't, don't put everything in, in, in suitcases. Just go. Leave. Leave everything behind. And he mentions especially those in Judea. Okay. He says, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Now, this is kind of fascinating because here we have uh, Jerusalem here up at the top. Okay, Judea is here. They're supposed to flee to the mountains. Okay. So as soon as they see an army advancing into, I mean, not even, I mean, in Judea, they are to go. They are to leave. They are to leave Jerusalem, flee, go into the mountains, hide, right? Because he is coming for you. He's coming to kill you, to destroy you and to uh, destroy uh, your children, everyone. Jesus told his disciples that it better not be during the winter. Pray that it's not in the winter. Well, why not? Well, of course, we're in winter. Yeah, I think you could kind of guess why. Because the temperature drops. From the low 40s, there's also heavy rain. So think about this, low temperatures, heavy rain, not a good sign, right? And it could get extremely cold at night. 
This could cause sickness. Uh, this could cause uh, fatigue, right, as they are traveling um, here. Um, it, it, it would be just a, a tumultuous time for them. So pray that it's not in the winter time, right, because then more lives may be lost due to the environment itself. Jesus continues to tell them that this time of affliction will be so severe that it has not occurred since the beginning of creation, since the present time he was speaking to them, and never will. He will make uh, Lenin look like a Boy Scout. There will be dictators that will go, dang, I, I wasn't that mean. This is, this is that type of person. It will threaten the elect in Israel's existence. He will seek to genocide them off the face of the earth. That's the point. And anyone who gets in their way, he will, he will take care of too. This is also highlighted in the book of Revelation chapter 13, verses 7 and 10, concerning the beast of the sea and the beast of the earth. In Revelation chapter 13, verses 7 and following, we read of this. And he, and he was permitted to wage war, that is, the beast of the sea, against the saints and to conquer them. He was also given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All those who live on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name is not written from the foundation of the world in the book of the life of the Lamb who was slaughtered. Verse 9, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is destined for captivity, into captivity he goes. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword he will be killed. This demands the perseverance and faith of the saints. Jesus is talking about this point here. If you are captured, you're captured. If you are executed, well, you are executed. This period will mark a severity un un unlike the world has ever seen. Matter of fact, God will cut short those days. He says that unless the Lord had shortened those days, no life would have been delivered. But only for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened those days. That's done by the bowl judgments he pours out on the earth that God judges those whom the conqueror slays. This is underscored in the book of Revelation, chapter 16, verses 1 to 21, where uh, 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 God's wrath is being poured out on the conqueror and his kingdom and his followers. Those who have taken the mark will suffer greatly as a result of these particular plagues. Jesus then gives one final warning similar to the one he gave in chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. And if anyone says to you, behold, here is the Messiah, or behold, he is there, do not believe. Do not believe. Even if they perform signs and wonders to lead you astray, do not believe it. This goes back to the beast of the earth and the false prophet who will perform many signs and wonders to the world and capture them. They are not to believe these. Well, congratulations, you just got about a year and a half of teaching in about 20 minutes. <laughs> to sum up, Jesus is warning them that they ought not to accept no substitutes when it comes to the Messiah, there is only one God. That means there's only one Messiah. There cannot be many. There is only one, right? And to the Hellenistic Jews of this time, this would be evidence to persuade them to see that he indeed was the one whom God sent, and he is God. He is the only one, right? 
That concludes Revelation 13, part one. We will pick up the rest of the chapter next week. Lord willing. Let's pray. Wow, what a chapter. Jesus laying out all of the things, all of the details of what is going to take place in the future for things to come. I thank you, Lord, for the clarity of this text and how uh, Jesus is instructing the disciples of the things that will take place, the fierce, tumultuous events, but also the hope that comes uh, when one endures in this time. Thank you, Lord, that we serve uh, uh, Jesus, whom is God in the flesh, who has died and resurrected for Israel and for us. Thank you so much, Lord, uh, for this information and instructing us by way of Mark. For it's in your son's name. Amen.